Welcome to this video, which has been produced to support the Bioforum Toolkit publication, Guidance for Risk Evaluation of X-ray Irradiation of Single-Use Systems. I'm Louisa Mitchell, Global Change Facilitator at Bioforum, and I'm joined today by Pritam Rajkuli, Global Bioprocess Sciences Lead at Takeda, and Samuel Dory, Principal Scientist, Materials and Irradiations of Sartorius. In this video, we aim to help you navigate the guidance and understand how you can adapt and modify the tools to suit your own organisation's quality management system and manage the changes associated with addition of X-ray irradiation as a sterilisation technology for single use systems. We acknowledge that the text in the following slides may be a bit small and unreadable when watching the video, so we highly recommend that you download a copy of the toolkit and have the files open at the same time for easy reference. The toolkit can be freely downloaded from bioforum.com. The guidance document and accompanying tools were developed and endorsed by an, a Bioforum collaboration of 50 industry experts from 25 leading biopharma companies and suppliers. So why did we write this guidance? Let's take a look in the next slide. So as demand for SUS continues to grow, it has the potential to outpace the current capacity for sterilisation by gamma irradiation. So X-ray irradiation is being introduced as an additional sterilisation technology to provide flexibility and to mitigate the risk of supply chain shortages. SUS suppliers have started to notify their customers of this change. So the toolkit that we have developed and published helps users navigate this challenge by defining and categorising X-ray risk within a GMP context and users' own local procedures. It helps end users specify requirements by referencing an industry recognised source and guides users on preparation of well-documented, consistent and aligned risk evaluation packages. <clears throat> this aligned approach using technically sound data-driven submission packages will subsequently enable regulators to effectively evaluate the changes. I will now hand over to Pritam, who will give you an overview of the video content and of the guidance documents itself. Thank you, Pritam. Thank you, Luisa. So let's see what is there in the published toolkit. It consists of three parts, the guidance document, an extra evaluation uh, spreadsheet, and this introductory video, which is intended to guide you through the suggested approach. Now let's look at the overview of the guidance. So the guidance is based on a simple stepwise process triggered by receipt of change notification and ending with closure of the change control. The tool provided in this guidance demonstrate this process in a decision tree and a spreadsheet based tool, both of which were created as a framework for simplified documentation of the evaluation and can be adapted to suit local procedures and quality management systems. In this video, we will focus on three steps that have generated most frequently asked questions. That is step two, three and four. And by walking you through the steps, we will de demonstrate how the evaluation and resultant outputs could be documented in the accompanied spreadsheet tool. Samuel will now be giving you an overview of the guidance and expected outputs. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Pritam. Thank you, Lisa, and hello, everyone. So as it has been previously mentioned, this guidance includes a process flow decision tree, which definitely help us to categorize and to define the change in four impact levels. It also guides us into the action which could be should be taken at each or the impact we will be saying later on. As Riza already said, this guidance will provide you a robust consistent and really repeatable methodology in order to get at the end very um, very easy documentation and to ease the risk or the risk evaluation review. As we said many times, this is a guidance, it is not a standard. So this tool should be, I would say, must be, we can say, must be adapted to fit to any local procedure and to any specific risk evaluation methodology. It's really up to you to adapt it. So 
there is a navigation between the video and the guidance document. What you can see that most of the time we provide the name or the different four chaps, the name of the toolkit, the name of the figure. And if we forget to, to mention it orally, they are directly indicated in the different slide we'll be reviewing all together. So now in the rest of this video, we will go through the different steps of this flow chart we can see here. So let's start with the step one. The step one is to trigger. So we will not cover the step one in detail in this video. However, of course, the step one consists in receiving the chain from the supplier and in reviewing all the available data. So now uh, the step two will be covered by Preta, and I will come back later on with a different step. Thank you, Samia. So now looking at step two, in step two, it is mainly to identify materials of construction risk within an assembly. We first create a MIRM, that is Material Impact Risk Matrix. This can be found in tab one uh, of the X-ray Radiation Risk Evaluation Tool Spreadsheet, that is in table four. Now, we use four criteria to assess the materials of constructions of each component in the assembly being evaluated. These are first A, known material compatibility with ionizing radiation. For this, the data is provided by PPSA. B, a review of the supplier's documentation package for X versus gamma. Now the third is C, any historical use of the components uh, sterilized by gamma irradiation. And finally, the fourth that is D, the number of successful similar materials of construction evaluations. The output of this stage is the ICC, that is irradiation compatibility category score, which indicates the overall risk that is either high, medium or low of the parts being evaluated based on material compatibility with ionizing radiation. Now, in the next slide, to facilitate a review of the supplier's documentation package, um, I think that's the next slide. Um, to facilitate a review of the supplier's documentation package, the evaluator can refer to the list of BPSA recommended testing per component type as shown in the tabs detail here. And in the X-ray radiation uh, risk evaluation tool, this provides a high level verification that the supplier has provided sufficient data as part of the change notification. It should be noted that not every component needs to be reviewed at this stage and judgment should be applied by the teams performing the evaluation. Now for step three, that will cover by Samuel. Over to you, Samuel. Thanks, Prita. So, <clears throat> okay, we saw that the step one is to trigger. We saw that the step two is to make the data review. Now let's jump uh, on to the step three, which is to categorize, is to assign the impact le level, different impact level. So we saw as well that with the ICT, we work at the component level. Now we'll be working at the assembly level. So once the ICC score has been determined for each material of construction, we take into account the worst case, worst case in terms of ICC, and to check further how we can use this ACC to assess the risk in the context of the SUS single use system for the intended use or the application. So to be able to do so, we can see that we can use this table and the template of this table can be found into the X-ray irradiation spreadsheet which is a, a tool given to the spreadsheet, and it is in tab two. So the impact level assigned tool reflects definitively the decision point in the end-to-end -end process flow and use the different uh, criteria we will be reviewing quickly here. So first of all, we need to check if the mat material impact risk matrix, which is in tab one, as the uh, time already showed you, indicate any with matter of construction based on the X-ray compatibility. Also, one of the criteria to take into account, it is based on the existing company practice, does the assembly require or not some extractable data? 
And what you can see is that depending on the decision A or decision B, you have to answer either yes or no. And depending on the way you have been answered to the previous question, it will indicate to what kind of next step you should do to further assess at the assembly level. So the other criteria to take into account is to check whether or not the assembly is applied in any atypical process condition. That is to say, for instance, getting high or low pH or very strong temperature or even strong solvent. We need to check as well if the assembly is used for long term storage of the DS or DP, drug substance or the product. And uh, Last but not least, of course, we need to check whether or not we could have EL safety margin in, in respective organization after the qualification obtained after the gamma elodation. So depending on all the responses of this criteria, the tool will guide us to evaluate to a final impact level score. And in that case, it is, you can see easily here, the ISAN impact level. And in that case, the rest of the guidance will give you suggesting action for each impact level. Okay, so first step to girl, second step to do the uh, data reviews, third step to make the to categorize. Now in the step four, we would be seeing what are the different actions we need to consider per impact level. So in the case of an impact level zero, we suggest that uh, the supplier equivalency documentation is accepted and no, that no further action is required. In a case of an impact level one, it is recommended that, of course, in that case, the user verifies the supplier equivalency assessment, once again, the context of the application of the process used. And to be able to do so, we suggest as well to refer to the accompanying X-ray irradiation risk evaluation tool. In that case, we need to refer to the individual component tab, once again, in the Excel spreadsheet. Or we can see as well an example which is given in the slide, this uh, 10 of this video, as already explained by uh, Prita. The purpose of this evaluation is really to determine at the component level if ad any additional end user testing is required based on the process, based on your process, of course, and to document the rationale for either acceptance of the change or the rationale for additional testing or additional uh, data. Of course, additional testing for unique use condition might be desirable, but we would say for that in the impact, impact level one, it should be only on exceptional cases. It's of course up to the end user adjustment, which is completely required here through our, our so the whole evaluation. So now, the action for the impact level two and three would be explained by Prita. Thanks, Samuel. So now let's look at impact level three. So in impact level three, accept based on level one with additional ENL data. Following regulatory guidance to date, adhere to USP 665, moderate risk evaluation with 50% ethanol to verify equivalency. Perform the risk evaluation in conjugation with the safety concern thresholds known as SCT using total organic carbon, TOC, or non volatile re residue NVR measures may also be appropriate in specific cases. Supply should include full extractable comparisons of gamma and extra treated products following USP 665 guidelines in addition to an, uh, uh, another required PPSA testing. If any exceptions arise, additional ENL st uh, studies may be required. Now let's look at slide three where we discuss impact level three. So in impact level three, the DSDP containers are anticipated to fall under this category as they provide a critical long-term protective barrier to the product. Further regulatory guidance is expected to be provided in future for impact level three products. Suppliers, customers may decide to initially adopt transition to X-ray sterilization of uh, single-use systems that are classified as level zero to level three level two, unless there is a critical driver for early adoption of level three. I will now let Samuel explain the final steps for you. Over to you, Samuel. 
Yes, thanks, Prita. Okay, so we saw that first step definitely to trigger the chain. We saw that the step two is really to make a data review. We saw that uh, the step two we need to categorize and to assign the different impact levels. And we saw what are the potentially all the subjective actions for each impact level. So now it is the time to mitigate in the final step and to close out. So of course, the goal of the final stage is definitely the readiness of the implementation of the change. And this is completely achieved by well documenting the evaluation and identifying any potential or any further evaluation or additional testing at definitely as a determined impact level. So we to go ahead with the mitigation, we suggest in that case to use the BPSA recommended test summary table. So if an impact level is, is assigned, as we said, we recommend not to perform additional testing. In that case, pretty easy. In impact level one, two or three is assigned, so risk evaluation should be completed by, of course, any appropriate ECM in that case, using the accompanying X-ray radiation risk evaluation tool. So this tool, I already said, definitely utilizes the BPC recommended test for the various component types. And here, of course, the purpose is also to create a framework of simplified consideration and documentation. This is really the purpose. It also so the support is also support the verification of the supplier data is also support the verification of the rational to be able to confirm the equivalency. So the, this tool includes one type per component type, and we can see one type per component, one type for sensor, one type for all the different component families, and provide also a detailed test categorization, that is to say either low, medium, or high. So it means that at minimum, the material must show equivalency across any any medium or high risk testing related to the functional, of course, or either physical, chemical evaluation, and of course, even biological aspect of the component. So we will be seeing that in, in the in the next slide. So we saw, of course, that the assessment demonstrates the equivalency at the component, but we need to consider that the overall assembly evaluation is based, of course, a combination of the results of the individual component evaluation. We will not show you that, but of course, it is something we need to keep in mind. So now, let's move to uh, one example. So in this example, we have evaluated a connector. So to be able to do so, we listed, for instance, all the different property indicated as medium or low risk as it is collected from the BPSA matrix. We also gathered all the different required data. We also uh, described the rationale for each property and for each additional testing which could be done. And at the end, taking everything into account, the list of properties, the list of rational, the list of additional, potential additional testing. This leads to a definition of the final risk assessment, right, which is given here, for instance, in the right hand side of this table. So we also gave another example in the figure eight of the guidance document. And uh, Pritam will now conclude on the path com of uh, completion, and uh, he will show you how this company adapted this tool to their own uh, procedure. So Pritam, start the jewels. Thank you, Samuel. So in conclusion, we have guided you through the end-to-end -end process flow detail in the guidance document and indicated which sections of the spreadsheet can be used to uh, document the evaluation process and how they can be adapted to suit your own local quality management systems. No, so now let, let's look how we can adapt them in the next slide. So the tools included in the guideline are adapted uh, to the specific process and quality management systems of individual organizations, right? And at Takeda, we gather all the necessary information outlined in these tools in a modified format. However, our ultimate risk assessment outcome is harmonized with the conceptual framework detailed in this guidelines and its accompanying tool. Now, 
Also, since the publication of the guidance in September 2023, some adaptations of the tools have been identified to facilitate application of the tools in other organizations own processes. The example shown in this uh, adapted MIRM table, which is transposed to enable easier so sorting. This facilitates the creation of a library of assessments already completed as additional changes are evaluated and also enables creation of standardized reports. Thank you. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Samuel. So as a final word, this again, this guidance toolkit was developed and written by a collaboration of Bioforum members, and our thanks go out to the core authors and contributors to this paper. I would also like to extend a special thank you to the team members highlighted here who contributed to the preparation of this supporting video, which I sincerely hope you found useful. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for improvement, we would be delighted to hear from you. Please contact myself on louisa.mitchell at bioforum.com. But we'd just like to say thank you for your attention today. Thank you to Samuel and Pritam and have a great day. Thank you.